for standing by and welcome to our first webinar of this academic year entitled NOAA Climate Resources. These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by Ohio Sea Grant, Office of the Research, Ohio Supercomputer, OSU Extension, and eight other OSU departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lakes residents. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today are two experts within the National, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Doug Cluck and Deke Art. Doug Cluck is the Central Region Climate Services Director for NOAA. He has worked for NOAA since 1992 with the National Weather Service and the National Climatic Data Center. Doug's region covers 14 states from Colorado to Michigan where he is responsible for coordinating and informing on climate service activities among federal, state, tribal, academic, and private interests in the region. Engagement with those groups and interpretation of climate information, monitoring, directing research, and education outreach are all essential parts of his activities. During extreme climate events such as drought and major flooding, Doug coordinates information response, attribution, and assessment among core partners. We're delighted to have him here today to talk about some great NOAA resources. Our other speaker is Deke Art. Deke has served as the Chief of the Climate Monitoring Branch at National Climatic Data Center since 2009. The branch is responsible for routine and special reporting of the status of the Earth's climate system from large global phenomena like global temperature changes to regional occurrences like drought and weather extremes. Art was one of the lead editors for the 2009, 2010, and 2011 editions of the State of the Climate Reports. We're delighted to have him as well. Thank you both for coming to uh, our webinar series. But before we get started, a few logistical issues. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, I will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right side of your screen and I will collect and pose your questions out to Doug and Deke at the end of their presentations. We have more than 200 participants on this webinar, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep those questions coming throughout the presentation and we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in our chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey and we will, it will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Doug Cluck from NOAA, who will present what are regional climate services, one perspective. Doug? Thank I you, Jill. And I think your introduction probably pretty much did my entire um, uh, slide deck here. So I'm going to show a lot of pretty pictures, and um, we'll just remember what Jill said. How about that? No, um, just, uh, just want to say thank you very much to Ohio the Ohio State University and Jill in particular for uh, allowing us to, uh, to present here today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, some of the some of the work that we've been doing for the last oh three or four years in terms of climate services uh, in NOAA and specifically with the National uh, uh, National Climatic Data. And uh, you'll see a lot of pictures throughout this whole presentation of various disasters and climate events, and that's purposeful because. As you'll see from a lot of what we do, um, a, a lot of time is spent, especially when communities, states, tribes, uh, etc., cetera, um, have these events happen. We learn a lot from them. We often learn what we're not adapted to and what we need to adapt better to in terms of mitigation. So anyway, um, on with the show here. I've got to find out where to push the button. There we go. Um, so first the definition, one definition, and there's many of these, but one is, is simply the development and delivery of climate products and services that are on, t on a time and, s on sp time and spatial scales needed by most decision makers. And that sounds pretty simple, maybe it, 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 you know, just uh, on the surface, but really there's a little more to it. And, and as you'll see, there's a lot more depth 
to uh, providing those that types those types of information. Um, I won't go into the great de on great detail on all uh, everything this slide says, but simply understand that the the, the development and delivery um, has a de 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 I'm sorry I'm stumbling over my own words too much caffeine I think. Uh, development and delivery, products and services in time and spatial scales, as well as decision makers, are things we're going to touch on later in this uh, slide deck. Oops. So some of the fundamentals that we found to be sort of true, I guess, across um, at least the work that I've done, is that to do climate services on a regional and even local basis, uh, there are some, I, I guess, uh, truisms, if you will, on things that w we have to keep in mind. And one of those is to maintain and evaluate our, uh, the relevance of the information that we provide. And that takes a sort of understanding what is going on, not only currently, but what has happened in the past and what may be happening and what people are worried about in the future. So you need to be, we need to be, in touch with uh, what matters to the various constituencies and sectors. Um, we also need to take an approach, uh, an iterative approach with those sectors and with those, uh, those concerns and, and try to stay away from the sort of one-off, we're done, we don't need to come back to, uh, come back to that particular issue or, or sector again because we've covered it. We also need to stay consistent with our, um, not only our, uh, our messaging, but we need to let people know that we are here uh, no matter uh, no matter what the situation is. And I'll show you some examples of how we tried to do that a little later. Um, there, is a, there is a factor of being reliable and trust, building trust as well, which are, are sort of key in terms of people actually listening to anything you have to say. Um, the other thing I'd like to stress is that we very much work across time scales. Uh, we don't work at the we don't always work at the, the 20, 50, and 100-year time scales in the future. We often work, and uh, we often work in the past, present, uh, and um, when we look at projections and predictions, uh, everything from two weeks all the way out to 100 years. And often is the case with many sectors, especially on the private side, um, that they are concerned most about what is going to be happening, for example, in the next growing season or you know what's going to happen in the next uh, next month or two so it's important for us from a service point of view to recognize those those needs as well um, again kind of focusing back up on uh, the maintaining and eva evaluating our relevance there's the problem focused approach understanding the place in history in which you are so in a particular basin you may have a history of flooding you may have upstream downstream contentions you may have many different uh, issues going on it's good to know that before you walk into a, walk into a, a meeting or, or or walk into a um, um, some sort of engagement with the private sector we also try to avoid reinvention and build on relationships that have already that already exist and uh, and, and seem to be working uh, that takes time and experience being in a particular region and having people that uh, you trust uh, to, to, to rely on telling you those things. Uh, finally, the, or not finally, but another, uh, another kind of fundamental is uh, we, we at NOAA and maybe even we at the federal government uh, can't do it all alone. It's very important that we work with uh, many different constituencies to solve problems. In fact, much of the time, we are an information source for them to solve their own problems. We don't necessarily say, hey, we can, we can solve every problem that you have, just invite us to the table, but we, we try to share that type of information that seems to be relevant to the particular issue at hand. Um, leveraging partnerships and networks is a key element for success. It kind of fits back into this joint solutions, but... Um, we, as you're going to see in a, in a couple slides, there are many, many different groups that we work with and different constituencies. And again, we could not do the kind of work that we do without them. And then finally, recognizing capacities. We all have, we all have limits, even though we don't like to admit them all the time, on time funding for sure, 
uh, our experience and even knowledge. So it's important to know what you, what you have to work with in your particular region. And that, again, many of these things are not something uh, you learn overnight. It takes time and sort of immersion, if you will, in, the, in those sort of local and uh, regional issues. Oops, I keep clicking like it's a regular PowerPoint. So here are some of the key services that we provide on a very, very broad scale. <clears throat> Uh, monitoring, and, and I'm going to leave this up to, uh, to Deke to talk about, but monitoring can be anything from, uh, well, I'll just let Deke talk about that and because um, he's even much better than I am. Uh, the other thing that we deal with a lot is data, not only the instrumentation of, of data and putting uh, actual uh, um, sites to, to measure the atmosphere and such, but the collection and databasing, and, and I, I guess the other thing I left off there is the availability of that data. That's one of uh, NCDC's or the National Climate Data Center's strongest suits in terms of having information available uh, to inform adaptation or to, to, inform, um, to, to inform decision makers. And then the prediction side is another part. We don't actually do the interpretation or we don't actually do the prediction, but we do the interpretation. And a lot of that is place and sector based. And a lot of it, it goes well beyond the, uh, well beyond the prediction, the, the, the co classical predictions like from the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, we value add based upon the current situation in a particular region. Uh, at least that's what we try to do with our partners. Um, outreach is a kind of continuing and a, a daily uh, issue, um, informing decisions and making uh, information accessible to them, uh, building capacity through education uh, for understanding what the heck we're even talking about and speaking at a level in which people can understand. And then um, trying, you know, from the research side of the house, not that we actually do a lot of research, but we certainly try to steer those folks in the sort of the applied climate and in other uh, areas uh, in the right direction in terms of uh, what we hear in, in terms of need. And then finally, finally uh, linkages back to how uh, leveraging networks and knowledge in our, our, and resources across the region is, is a key, I, I guess, service that we provide. In other words, who do you con again? I don't necessarily have all the answers for everything, but I often know who does, and that is, I guess, uh, uh, one of the services that we provide. <clears throat> so who are who are we? Um, when I say we, it's not just these six people, but let's say that these six guys uh, and, and gals are the bedrock of the regional climate. Uh, service uh, uh, as it stands today in within the National Climatic Data Center. Um, we have people covering the entire U.S., and you're more than welcome to reach out to any of them on any particular issue. In fact, they'd love to hear from you. Um, if you need their contacts, you can contact me, or if you know them, um, feel free. We also work very, very closely with the regional climate centers. This is where they are, and I hope I'm not going to confuse everybody with all the different regions and different groups I show you, but this is sort of the lay of the land in terms of regional climate services. Uh, <coughs> I'm actually uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska at the moment giving this presentation, but normally I, I, I reside in Kansas City. But the, the, uh, in, in, in the central region where I am, the High Plains Regional Climate Center and the Midwestern Regional Climate Centers are the two that I rely on for uh, Providing a lot of information and data, and then there are then there is. And I guess I don't have who this is, but this is the American Association of State Climatologists <clears throat> map. And every one of the yellow states, actually every one of the states except for Tennessee, has a state climatologist. <clears throat> and again, they are they are uh, part of the regional climate service portfolio, I guess, or partnership, and very important to our uh, our success. Uh, I also quickly want to mention the NOAA regional collaboration groups. These are groups within NOAA that try uh, that that work very hard to get other parts of NOAA to work with each other and those groups I just showed you in the, uh, before that, as well as others. 
and those are their regions as well. And then finally, there are the, reg the RESAs, the Regionally uh, Integrated Sciences Assessments. Uh, you'll see that much of the region that the central region that I'm in um, actually doesn't have that except for the Great Lakes and far to the west and the Western Waters uh, Assessment Group. Um, uh, but we're working on that to uh, enhance those. So these are all groups. This is a NOAA-funded group, as uh, I should say, as are the uh, high, uh, as are the regional climate centers. And in terms of key federal partnerships, you know, first I'm going to apologize. I'm only going to show a, a few of these, but these are sort of um, the ones you've, I'm sure many of you have heard of before that uh, that are very sort of focused on climate-related issues and some and again groups we rely on a lot for information and direction but there is the landscape conservation cooperatives uh, under DOI <coughs> sorry there are the uh, uh, climate science centers and again I didn't I guess I didn't put the uh, actual uh, name on these the climate science centers as well as the uh, um, U, the new USDA Ag Hubs. Um, all of these have very, uh, very strong climate-related programs associated with them, and we all have uh, sort of niche, niche parts in our uh, in our work. And it's uh, a great collaborative with all the federal agencies that we we work with. This is just a diagram, sort of showing what climate resources. I don't have all the states, tribes, urban, and academic groups, but it does give you a sort of a round out picture of who we deal with and what we deal with in terms of federal agencies. So here, the next part of this presentation is going to be some of the examples of uh, some of the, I guess, uh, things that we've done in the last few years in terms of uh, products and information, I guess you could say, uh, important for, the, for, for at least the central region. <clears throat> One thing that we do is a monthly webinar to sort of update folks on the latest, uh, to summarize the, the, the latest climate um, information as well as look at the future in terms of season, mainly from a seasonal point of view. We don't uh, we don't <laughs> we don't monthly look at climate change uh, issues too much, but most of the time it is uh, issues particular uh, to uh, to flooding, drought, uh, uh, and, and unusual climate events, and to give some heads up or early warning to um, potential issues in the in the future. <clears throat> a number of presenters a number of presenters and partners help us with these, including the State Climatologist, National Drought Mitigation Center, Regional Climate Centers, USDA, and LCCs. It's been a very popular uh, series, kind of like this one. Um, I guess this is a little bit more about these webinars, and actually I, I did put in um, how you can link up to them. They're once, once a month, they follow the Climate Prediction Center's uh, predictions, I guess you could say, every third Thursday of each uh, month, and these were started as a as a sort of response to the 2011 flooding in the Missouri Basin, when there was a lot of concern about 2012 spring being just as wet and just as damaging, and having infrastructure issues. There was a lot of a lot of worry up and down the Missouri Basin, and so we thought that we would you know provide whatever information that we had to uh, to help with that situation. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we publish, I guess you could say, is uh, across the country are the quarterly sub-regional climate summaries and outlooks. In this particular case, for the central part of the uh, central part of the U.S., we do three. We do one for the Midwest, we do one for the Missouri Basin, and we also do one for the Great Lakes. <coughs> All these are fabulous uh, collaborations with a number of different entities. And, in case, uh, in the Great Lakes case, we actually uh, work with the government of Canada to produce a sort of cross-boundary, if you will, uh, view of the Great Lakes region and basin. And they're available at that URL at the bottom of this. Uh, and, they, and actually, they just got updated, I think, yesterday. So you can go find the latest 
quarterly uh, summaries uh, there, and that will be for uh, it'll say something like September 2014 on them. Um, I guess I won't go into great description about those, but they are made. They're meant to be. They're meant to be used to provide information to decision makers at, at not necessarily climatologists. Sort of, it, it, we use as plain a language as we possibly can uh, to communicate uh, highlights that have happened over the last season, what the current sort of trend is in terms of. Uh, how, high, how hot or wet it's been or cold or dry it's been in the particular region in question. And then we talk a little bit about impacts from those climate events over the last three, or three months, as well as a short section on the outlook for the next, next three months for that particular uh, region. One thing that we are soon going to be putting online is, and it was developed uh, again uh, within the last week or so, this was finished, I should say, for the same three areas, Missouri Basin, Great Lakes, and uh, Midwest, uh, is, the, uh, is sort of an El Nino impacts and outlook uh, summary, if you will. Every time there is an El Nino, uh, or La Nina for that matter, we tend to get quite a few questions about what that means for us. And this is one way of sort of uh, alleviating <laughs> or, or teaching or educating folks about what it does mean. It, there's a myth-busting section on the back. P people assume that El Nino means something where it may or may not. Um, so, we use, so we'll be distributing these soon, is what I would say about that. We'll try to, if anybody's interested in that, we'll try to make sure that uh, they get a copy or find a URL to them. Um, we mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier in terms of assessing and uh, attributing, and um, Marty Hurling was actually on this particular webinar series talking about how they do attribution to uh, particular extreme events. <clears throat> Here's two cases or two examples. Uh, the one on the right is the uh, is in response to the 2011 Missouri River Basin flood, and it is an attribution of what caused that. Uh, what caused that? And they do a, they do sort of a uh, a study, if you will, uh, to understand if it were how much basic climate variability versus uh, climate change versus random um, particular events are. And the one on the left is for the drought. The following year, after 2011, was 2012 drought. Um, on the heels of the 2011 flood. There are other ones too. Again, there are uh, <clears throat> places to go and find these. I, I included the URLs in there in case you wanted to uh, see them yourselves. And there are longer reports from both of these. This is something that's, again, going to be coming out in the next week or two. <clears throat> uh, thanks to our part many partners, but mainly the National Drought Mitigation Center for uh, actually putting it together and doing, doing yeoman's work in contacting the 14 states. Uh, this 2012 drought assessment is mainly for this particular region. Again, that's uh, the, what we call the central region or the north central, if you will, part of the U.S. <clears throat> We also do an incredible amount of uh, engagements and interactions, whether it's on the phone or in person. This is something that happened actually last week in Rapid City. It was a, it was a uh, nationally, National Integrated Drought Information System sponsored, which is part of NOAA, uh, NIDAS, part of NOAA, um, that looks at drought and, and climate extremes, if you will, or climate events, and tries to help or organize uh, uh, information for different groups in different areas of the U.S. And, and in this particular case, it was the Missouri Basin that we're focusing on and um, the 28 tribes <clears throat> in the basin themselves. And so uh, we had a very good turnout uh, at this meeting with some of our, many of our uh, uh, tribal partners as well as federal, state, and, um, and academic. And those, there they are. So anyway. That's a, a, an example of the type of interactions that we do and engagements, and usually leads to really good things. Uh, a little bit more about NIDAS, I guess. Uh, we also held a meeting uh, in February, more of a kickoff meeting for the Missouri Basin in terms of uh, uh, um, in, in terms of uh, 
drought early warning systems and um, planning for drought and mitigating drought. And this was a, a I guess you'd say a kickoff meeting for, for NIDAS in the Missouri Basin. If you want to, there's another link there if you want to get a, a copy of this particular item. There are the NIDAS pilot areas in case you were wondering where they are and uh, wanted to show that to you. Uh, it, the main one in the region that I work in is the Missouri Basin pilot, which is just underway. And just to give a, another, a, again, very sort of uh, m central region specific uh, services, uh, North, we work a lot on um, other issues, uh, sometimes internationally with Canada. Uh, the North American Climate Services Partnership is one of those. We work closely with federal agencies. We have created a Missouri Basin Climate Collaboration, federal climate collaboration. There is also something like that in the, uh, the Midwest. Um, obviously, lots of national climate assessment type information gets disseminated uh, through us, if you will, and um, always, always doing a lot of information delivery via interpretation and uh, synthesizing per audience. And I, what I mean by that is, uh, if you're talking to a group of agriculturalists uh, uh, at, the, at, at, let's say, the producer level, you'll say, uh, you may say, you, you may direct your, your presentation in, in a very different way than you would um, being talking to a, a number of urban type folks. <clears throat> and that's about all I have. I don't know. Um, am I over time? A little bit over time. Sorry about that. And more disasters here um, to talk about. Most of these... Um, all of these are in, in the central region. But thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Uh, this is a great presentation. We have some great questions, but we'll hold off on those questions until the end of uh, Deke's presentation. Uh, so now I would like to uh, introduce Deke Art from the National Climatic Data Center, who will be presenting NOAA's Climate Monitoring Services. Deke, you have the ball, and you should be all set. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Deke Arndt. I am a small part of the climate monitoring branch uh, here at, uh, which is a small part of the climate monitoring that goes on at NCDC, which does some of the climate monitoring for our parent agency, NOAA, which does some of the climate monitoring uh, around our country. So, um, as Doug mentioned, um, when you get involved in climate services, you you have to get involved with a lot of partners. So, I'm going to speak uh, more towards uh, the National Climatic Data Center, or NCDC's, efforts in climate monitoring uh, and, and what we do and some of the philosophies that we take and hopefully along the way some of the products that you might be able to uh, use yourself uh, in, your, in your work or your research. All right, so hopefully I'm doing this right. So quick commercial for NCDC, wonderful place. Um, uh, I, we work with a lot of people that I adore. Uh, on climate monitoring and just taking care of all the world's data, the world's weather data that comes in uh, to this building. So when you see the weather person uh, show the weather map with the numbers and the observations on it, eventually those numbers end up here in Asheville um, in, in one of the, the, well, actually the world's largest uh, meteorological and climatic data center. Um, so we've been in the Asheville area since the middle of the 20th century. Okay. Um, so just quickly, you know, Doug mentioned uh, he had so many different types of climate services to mention. I'm going to focus on one, climate monitoring, um, and what exactly is that. And kind of simply put, if you think about a baseball game, climate monitoring is a combination of the scorekeeping, um, the play-by-play, -play, and the analysis and kind of statistical analysis of the climate system. So when you think about a baseball game, you think, you know, to do this, you, you've got to know the game, uh, you know, and, and people, when they sit down to watch or analyze a baseball game, they have varying needs. They either want to hear the play-by-play, -play, they want to hear the analysis, they want the stats, or they just want to know the score, and monitoring kind of tries in for the climate system to do that. So um, what we'll talk about in the next 12, 15 minutes or so are just some of the ways that we try to address these needs um, that are listed on here. How, how, how do the numbers reflect the overall game? Uh, what is the score? What are the statistics? Where is the ball? 
um, that kind of stuff uh, with the climate system. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of some of the the spectrum, the the tensions. Um, so in a, in a climate monitoring as a service, we serve both a science type function, an assessment type function, and a decision support. You know, real people using real data every day to help analyze their own business practices. And we, we try our best to support these two different communities and all of the communities kind of in between. And we, um, well, this will come out uh, in the products and services that we highlight, um, but there's a, a real need for the quickest data possible, but there's also a competing need for the most precise data possible. And these types of decisions uh, that, that we face on here, and Doug mentored the spatial scale and time scales and, and how we get these observations. And these are the kind of things that we try to integrate in a climate monitoring service. So uh, with that said, we'll jump straight into uh, kind of what we do. So that first, ten, uh, that first tension was the needs of our climate science and then the needs of our larger economy. Um, so we support both of these. We're going to focus on the second. We'll kind of uh, go quickly through the, how we support the science. Um, but climate monitoring helps with verification and assessment of the state of the climate. Um, how, do we, how is the climate system evolving over time? Um, what kind of uh, climate variability and climate change and just climate features themselves um, are occurring on the planet? And it really helps us evaluate having this validating data. It helps us evaluate what is our understanding of the climate system as well. We work a lot with that community. We won't focus a lot on that today. We'll focus more on our products and services that go out the front door towards the larger economy. And we help hopefully support decisions and analyses out there in the real world. So how does, uh, you know, it helps the market better understand how climate is affecting their own spreadsheets. So when they take our numbers or our analysis and compare it to what has happened um, with their business. Uh, weather is a huge part of our lives. It drives many of the things that we do. It also drives a lot of the economic decisions we make. So the products and services and data that we can arrange and provide to those folks um, is an important driver of, of what we do, and it, it's a big, in, in many ways, shapes the, the projects and the products and the services that we work on. All right, moving on. So uh, just the last slide with the science. Uh, one of the, the most fun interactions we have with the kind of science and, and climate assessment community is through uh, the BAM State of the Climate, and this is uh, an annual report uh, published through the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, and it hits dozens of what are called essential climate variables um, kind of all over the world on land, in the air, in the oceans, in the, in the frozen parts of the world, and really assesses how is the planet's climate system uh, evolving, and this fits within a number, a larger body of these types of assessments, like the National Climate Assessment and the uh, IPCC. This is kind of the um, annual physical of the climate system that informs those even larger uh, assessments, and is available um, at the URL provided right there. All right, so that is uh, as much as we'll talk about the science, and now we'll talk about what we call operational climate monitoring, which is about um, compiling information that helps people understand what's going on around them in the climate system. So um, putting up a, fi a fictional story, if you were to read through the bullets on, these, on this story, you know, starting out with I was driving at a certain speed, 41 miles per hour, that is a fact. And with, but without those other bullets, it really means nothing. And if you read down, as it builds context, this story <laughs> This particular story gets a lot more horrible as you go from top to bottom. But all of those facts together provide the context for what is going on. And climate monitoring uh, faces a similar st struggle. Um, so transitioning and keeping this story in mind where um, I was clearly driving at a speed that was measured, um, that speed could be compared to some sort of baseline speed, the speed limit in this case, and then some of the impacts and context of what was going on in this story, um, they, they basically taken together mean a lot, a lot more than they would individually. So the climate, monitoring the climate is the same way. So if I were to tell you that the first eight months of 2014, the annual global temperature was approximately 58 and a half degrees, 
would not mean a whole lot to a lot of people. But if we were able to add some context and say, well, based on uh, what we know about the 20th century, this is about uh, a little more than a degree Fahrenheit warmer than the 20th century. Then you at least now know that we're on the warm side of history, uh, at least the 20th century. And if I were to say that's the third warmest value that we have observed uh, this way, then that really starts to give you context. That these first eight months of this year, and all of these facts are true, by the way, first eight months of these, this year was uh, ranked third out of some group of years. Oh, well, that's a 135-year record. So that helps you put that into context. And then adding another fact, this was the 354th consecutive month, August was, that was uh, warmer than its 20th century average. So uh, not warmest, I'm sorry, warmer than its 20th century average. So these facts together is a very, very, very scaled down, simplified version of what we try to do with climate data and turning it into useful monitoring uh, information. So here is that exact same set of facts, but put into a graphical uh, context. So uh, this happens to be global temperature, probably the most prominent uh, global variable that we track, especially in terms of climate change and global warming. So uh, 2014 through August um, is way up there on the top. Um, one of the one of the facts um, is that if we continue with our current uh, 1.2 degrees uh, Fahrenheit above normal or about 0.7 degrees Celsius above normal, if that holds for the next four months, we will eventually have the warmest year of this 130-something year record. So again, this graph shows each year from 1880 on the left to 2014 on the right. The blue crosses are the individual years. If they're above the dark line, they were warmer than the 20th century average. If they were below the dark line, they were cooler than the 20th century average. And you can see some things in this graph. This graph pulls out even more context of this global uh, temperature record. We can see generally an increase with lots of little ups and downs along the way. Um, so one way that we try to contextualize the data is turn data into graphics so that people don't have to do that themselves. They can take a quick look and assess what they need to uh, assess. And this data was available through our Climate at a Glance tool and the URLs on the bottom there. All right, so that was very quick. So what makes good monitoring? Um, so the first thing we need to do is report what happened. Uh, report that I was driving 41 miles per hour or report that the average temperature so far has been 58.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And then um, provide some context. How different is that from some baseline? Is that faster or slower than the speed limit? Or is that warmer or cooler than the 20th century? And then how unusual is that? And that's where that third warmest um, rank uh, comes in. And then importantly, what is the trend? Is this part of a larger trend? Is this part of what we have seen in the recent past? Is this part of what we expect in the, in the upcoming future? And then again, what are the impacts? So if we can take data and use data to answer those five questions on the top, we're doing a pretty good job of monitoring. Um, but we also need to remember um, about variability and how things change and the extremes that we experience. And we always need to remember to be able to provide the data and the history of that data uh, to people that want to dig into the numbers that went into our monitoring information. Um, so monitoring is rooted in history. Um, just like the story about my driving needed some context, um, the historical record is what provides a lot of the context for our monitoring efforts. So being lucky enough to sit here in the world's largest collection of weather and climate data allows us to really explore as much of the history as we can and be able to put today's weather and climate into this deeper context. Um, so this is a function that's kind of a natural here for NCDC, although it does happen all, all around the country in various offices, and Doug mentioned many of our partners. And I just want to pause on that last bullet, um, that these, this historical record is, is um, not overstating it. It's a national treasure. Um, this has come from generations of people, many of whom are now no longer with us, who have taken these observations and taken care of these observations and recorded these observations and stored and safely stewarded these observations so that uh, groups like mine and groups like yours can go find them and make sense out of them. So we are at the uh, kind of the, the end of the pipeline or part of the circle of life of all this 
uh, climate data. So it's important that, uh, that we always stop to recognize that. All right, so same data that we just looked at. Um, so what does that 2014 purple crosshair look like when you spread that single value out on a map? And these are a couple of ways that we try to do that. So both of these maps are built on the same historical data. Both of these maps try to show January through August of 2014 um, in context of history. The map on the left says here is how Jan these first eight months of the year stack up to those same periods um, average the normal, so to speak, from the, the late 20th century through 2010. So if you take the 1981 to 2010 average and call that normal, the map on the left shows how the, this year stacks up against that normal. Why don't we use the 20th century for the average for that map on the left? Simply put, that whole map would be red. And when people look at maps, they are usually looking at contrast and they want to see um, how different regions varied from each other. So using a recent period that is almost as warm as what we're experiencing today allows us to provide some contrast on the map so people can compare the eastern United States and Canada and the relatively cool temperatures that we've had to the really warm temperatures that we've had in the western part of North America. The map on the right is for the folks that want to dig into the deeper history. And that map shows for each one of those grid boxes where does their first eight months of the year compare to their own history, each grid box's own history. So where you see the darkest red, that grid box had the warmest January through August that we've observed since 1880. And as you go from right to left along the scale on the bottom, it's the warmest, it's the top 10%, the top one third, the white value is the middle third, and as you go cooler on the cool side, it's the coolest third, it's the coolest 10%, and the coolest on record. So that's what we've seen so far. That's something that we reported. The URLs on the bottom, these global temperatures, and, and the global analysis comes out around the 18th through the 21st of the month, uh, and it's available. So we just released uh, last week the uh, August 2014 global numbers. All right, so what's that mean in the USA? We already alluded to the fact that, uh, that this was uh, a very cool uh, summer and year to date in the eastern half of the United States, and it's been really warm and dry in the western part of the United States. Um, the analyses, the numbers um, are all available at the URL below. We released the U.S. report around the 8th to the 11th of the following month, and this is the same type of graphic. It puts the temperatures that were observed uh, each summer compared to that region's own history. So parts of California had their warmest summer on record. Parts of the lower Mississippi Valley had a bottom 10%, a coolest 10% summer on record. What makes an average? So an average temperature is an average of the high temperature and the low temperature of the day. And one thing that's really interesting when you break out that same summer that we just looked at and we compare the high temperatures from the summer, the afternoon temperatures, so to speak, uh, they were quite cool throughout most of the U.S., but when we look at the overnight lows just from this summer, they were quite, uh, quite a bit warmer. Um, that is consistent meteorologically with a pretty wet summer through most of the country, but each of these maps means different things to different people uh, and different industries. Uh, the energy industry is very concerned with that map on the right because the warmer summer nights are, the longer that people leave their air conditioners on, that's more electric demand. Um, that's more energy demand, and so it's a, a bigger tax on the energy infrastructure if summer nights are warm. Um, it's also, uh, if it's very warm, pretty hard on agriculture. Um, on the flip side, the, the afternoon temperatures were delightfully cool throughout much of the Midwest and, and the Mid-South, um, and the, uh, the corn crop is, is coming in uh, great this year because there was not a great deal of, of heat stress on that crop. The afternoon evaporation demand wasn't as high. So um, again, breaking out that average temperature into two different pieces that mean different things to different industries is part of our responsibility that we try to meet each month. Um, and then we try to take uh, raw meteorological data and combine that into things that are, are more meaningful uh, societal impacts. So, this is an example of some of these societal impacts variables that we have. This happens to be a graphic of summer 
estimated summer energy demand from residential areas based on where people live and where the summer temperatures were. And you can see that in general, with a lot of little wiggles up and down, as far as residential energy demand, it has been growing due to the climate, the climate of the United States uh, over the last few decades. Um, extremes are also important, and this is really where we're trying to focus a lot of our new energies in the future. So we have, and I won't dive into the details of each of these indices, but um, you know, some of the things we do here at NCDC, both within the climate monitoring branch and in other parts of the building, are examine how are the big events changing. Um, the, the graphic on the left is a part of our climate extremes index that looks at how much of the country experienced really warm or really cool uh, temperatures over time, and you can see that uh, the last few decades we've been more and more of the country has been dealing with warmth in the first uh, part of the year. But you see 2014 really sticks out there at the end of the graph. A big chunk of the country dealt with these really cold temperatures. Um, so this index tries to, and with many like that, tries to examine how the big events are changing over the United States. Billion dollar disasters, which is a combination of weather events, where they happen, and the value of the things that they beat up um, are all part of the, the mix for billion dollar disasters. We can see generally through changes in weather events and where they happen and the value of the things that, that weather events impact, we're, we see uh, more billion dollar disasters in recent years than in the late 20th century. Um, and then as Doug alluded to, time scale really matters. And we're, we're coming around the bend, we're, we're about to the finish line here. This is a graph we call a Haywood plot. It comes out uh, sometimes with our U.S. monthly reports. And this is for the city of Wichita Falls, Texas. The bright blue line is the rain that they received from June 1st on the left to August 31st on the right of 2014. The dark gray line is how rain would, on average, accumulate over the course of the summer. So it was actually a pretty wet summer, slightly wetter than normal summer. Uh, 2014, that blue line riding above the gray line for much of the summer, meaning they were ahead of the curve. They were wetter than normal for much of the summer. And that's great for the fire people. And the, the, uh, but if you look at the year to date, that wet summer took place in context, um, followed some really dry months. And so for the year to date, that wet summer hasn't caught them up to normal yet. You can see the blue line 2014. Uh, still not up to normal, about four inches below normal uh, for Wichita Falls, and then time scale really matters. If you expand that out to five years, this is the gray line would be the average precipitation you would expect to accumulate over five years, and you can see that the last five years have been the driest five-year period in the modern history of Wichita Falls, Texas, and this wet summer has done little to help that out. Wildfire folks, they don't really care about that. If, that. if it's rained well in the last few days, that tamps down the wildfire danger for a few days. Reservoir managers, the people that are in charge of getting water and having enough water, they really, really care on this longer time scale. So we are, are part of our responsibility is to understand that different folks have different sensitivities to different time scales and provide the kind of data they need. So finally, uh, who uses this? Um, we uh, just uh, we had uh, some late reports earlier this year for some logistical reasons, and these are the types of folks that 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 we heard from. So um, yeah, we expected to hear from the meteorologists, and they would say, "When is your data coming?" And we also heard from a lot of companies that monitored their retail sales patterns. We heard from the finance industry who were monitoring other companies' retail sales patterns and commodities. We heard a lot from Big Ag, a very traditional user of climate monitoring information, a lot from energy, um, and then, of course, our, our many of our partners in the public sector that we um, share data with and that rely on our services as well. Um, finally, the drought is an extreme. It's a combination of temperature, precipitation, and water demand. And I just threw this on here. This is an example of, of one thing that we participate in in climate monitoring. But as Doug said, this is led by a multitude of different institutions, and we are just one of those. And uh, this is a weekly assessment of how bad the drought is uh, across the United States uh, and uh, Puerto Rico as well. So uh, the point of that is it really takes a village to get all of this information together. 
no single observing system, no single institution, or no single approach will help everybody. Climate's complex, people are complex, the society we live in is complex, and so we really rely on these partners. And we, it's, it's a shame to put them in the bottom two-thirds of a slide because these folks down here are a big part of, of what we accomplish together in getting good climate information out there to the country. Um, finally, drought.gov happens to sit. The U.S. Drought Portal is the public face of the NIDAS program that Doug mentioned earlier. Um, it sits at NCDC, also taking advantage of this great stockpile of data and how can we put today's drought in the context of the historical droughts that we've seen. And so one of the things that they're working on is getting a gridded, this, this standardized precip and evapotranspiration index is basically one way to look at drought. And they're working on ways to take advantage of upcoming gridded data sets. Uh, so that they can lay uh, this data uh, out there and people can see on a finer resolution what's going on. And the data is actually available through drought.gov and they're working on how to map this. And that brings up a good point. Is as we go forward, satellites are going to be way more important in what we understand and they have real strengths. They, this is another one of those tensions. Um, these in situ records, these weather stations around the world have been there a long time and we know exactly how they behaved over time, so we can get a lot of really great historical information from them. But the satellite-sensed information is available quickly, and it's available across a broad region, and so we're trying to find ways to blend the, the strengths of these two data sets. And this is not just NCDC. This is the whole climate monitoring community is working on taking the strength of that historical record and marrying that to the strength of remotely sensed data. Big effort here at NCDC as well. So then uh, to wrap up, you know, what get, makes good climate monitoring is being able to say definitively what happened. This is how big it was. How different is that from some baseline? How unusual is that? Is this part of a trend? And then what were the impacts? And we rely on our partners around the country to help us define those impacts. Um, and I'll stop there. I'll leave this slide up. This is where you can get some of the information that we just showed and uh, uh, turn it back over to Jill. Great. Thank you, Deke. Uh, we have a lot of great questions, so let me just go through. Um, I'm going to start with um, questions that we got uh, for Doug, and I guess feel free, Deke, if there's some things that you can um, add to uh, any of Doug's responses, feel free to jump in. Um, <clears throat> and Doug, you are unmuted, right? You're good? Uh, only if you can hear me now. Yes, you're good. Okay. Uh, one question, um, and this probably is for both Deke and Doug. Uh, even though historic weather data is available in each state, it is difficult to compile and analyze um, lack of researchers, fund, resources, and funding. Does the NCDC provide the support? Um, hey, this is Deke. So go ahead, Deke, if you want to start. You bet. So we have an entire uh, group of people that are, their, their foremost mission is to help people find the products and services that they need. So um, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the contact information, but if you go to that top URL um, and you will find uh, links to uh, help find climate information, both the monitoring products and the raw data. And there are a number of automated services as well uh, within NCDC's uh, website. So um, the, the short answer is yes. There are, there are both computer applications and more importantly there are trained professionals, uh, meteorologists that can help you get to uh, the data that you're looking for. Another question that we uh, got was, and again this might be for both of you, uh, it's rather difficult to sort sort through all the information related to our potential resources, is there some sort of PDF of contacts or a single go-to person if uh, someone would like to dig up a climate statistic such as number of extreme rain events in a certain area? Yeah, so it, it really depends on the question, of course, what the answer is going to be. And I think um, in terms of finding individual finding individual answers for very specific questions like that last one, um, you can go through the NCDC or 
there are the regional climate centers too. Um, I would say one good way to do these things is through the uh, is through Google, and not necessarily asking the question that way, but finding who has that kind of data might be a uh, um, one option in terms of doing that. Deke, do you have anything to add? No, I just say that the, these kinds of um, you know kind of Google era tools are. are uh, and our data access branch is actually working on uh, improving that and helping to provide uh, keywords and um, basically to really facilitate helping people find the statistic or the particular data set that they need. It's an ongoing process. The world is changing really fast in terms of technology, and uh, they are racing to keep up with it. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions. Uh, from Deke's presentation, uh, Deke, is there a standard precision for weather parameters that the NCDC keeps? Uh, that's a great question. So, um, kind of, uh, so yes, yeah, so for, and, that, and it also depends on the scale, uh, both the time scale and the space scale. So, most weather stations, for example, if we just use temperature as an example, they usually measure to the whole degree. Uh, most of the stations that we get are, we get a high temperature that are rounded to the whole degree and a low temperature that comes in as a whole degree. Well, thankfully, for the same reason that uh, a quarterback's yards per attempt uh, passing average can't, you know, since each pass a quarterback throws is measured in whole yards, but if he throws enough passes, you can say that Tom Brady throws for 12.25 yards per attempt, you can do the same thing if you aggregate enough um, weather data as well. So for national averages, for, the, for time scales as large as a month or larger, we will go to a hundredth of an inch. Um, for these smaller regions, for states and parts of states, we feel confident rounding to a tenth of an inch. Again, because we know we have lots of stations reporting over many days throughout the season and we're able to um, make more precise averages for those areas. For a single station on a single day, we're not going to, uh, not going to do that. But for lots of stations over a long time with many observations, we can use the power of that statistical uh, central limit theorem to, to come up with these decimal values. Thanks, Deke. Um, there, uh, we've had a couple of questions dealing with what the National Weather Service provides and what uh, the NCDC provides. And there was one example um, that maybe I'll just ask and you'll be able to answer, I think, probably generally to hit a couple of the others. Uh, our local National Weather Service office says that there is normally about 20, 90 degree days locally, but the NCDC database shows about 13 90 degree days as of the, for the 1981 to 2010 average. Who's correct? So one of the things that happened with the Weather Service is um, in the middle of that 1981 to 2010 period, they really modernized a lot of of their equipment and during the course of that modernization, some of that equipment moved. And so uh, NCDC's um, values that are calculated take that into account. When, when we do have interruptions in station data like that, we have algorithms and methods and techniques that we study and publish and then use in order to um, come up with uh, these average values that more accurate or more from a climate perspective, more thoughtfully approach the whole 30-year period and what we would have seen if the new station had been in place the entire time. And that's part of uh, just the, the profession of applied climatology is learning how to take these uh, weather data from stations and how to turn them into useful and accurate climate information. Thanks, Deke. Uh, I, I would like to do ask three more questions if the both of you are game. It is one o'clock, so I just want to double check to make sure you're okay if I ask three more questions. 
too bad. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, one question that we had was, well, we actually had a couple dealing specifically about um, where they can get this type of information. So let me just ask one. Um, which website or graph is best, sorry, hold on, um, I've lost it now, oh, sorry. Um, which website or graph is best to see how bad last summer drought and winter cold were in our area? This is from someone who is in the National Park Service that uh, uses your information. She said specifically she had a hemlock. She had hemlock trees that turned gray and then died over the winter. So it'd be great. She knew which where she could get that information about last year. Dick, that sounds like state of the climate, right? Yeah, you bet. So there's a couple of resources. Um, Doug mentioned these monthly state of the climate reports, um, and that is uh, available through uh, the the monthly reports link there. So there is a specific monthly write up of the drought. Uh, phenomenon in each of those uh, monthly reports. Um, there's also data uh, that uh, are associated with it, and you can kind of get to that drought data through the Climate at a Glance tool that is the, the fourth link on this screen uh, right now. Um, so from a narrative standpoint, from just a, a, an expert's assessment, those monthly reports are good. They have links to a lot of data. The Climate at a Glance will provide access to um, various drought indices, you know, that you can kind of zoom into uh, parts of your states. And then, uh, and we developed that in collaboration, uh, some of the tools that are in part of that climate at a glance with the, with the U.S. drought portal uh, that works uh, right in our branch. And then finally, I wouldn't discount the, the monthly U.S. drought monitor, which each Thursday comes out as an expert assessment of the severity of the drought. And they keep a, an archive of... Uh, all of those weekly assessments and you know we're again just like Doug alluded to and I alluded to this is a community of agencies and institutions that work together every week with hundreds of experts out in the field you know that are experiencing drought and reporting conditions and impacts there so that weekly drought assessment uh, each of the categories D1, D2, D3, D4 those are uh, tied with a, a, an unusualness or how often we would expect to see a drought this severe. Um, so if you do go to those uh, uh, weekly assessments, they keep them online. You can, you can go back all the way to 2000 and you can kind of see how the drought evolved, how a, a community of experts assessed that drought and how severe it was as well. Great, thank you. Um, Another question, uh, we do a lot of summarizing extreme precipitation events to construct return interval plots, but often the individual extremes are flagged in the records as outliers. What are the criteria that the NCDC use, uses to flag events as outliers? Hey, this is Deke, and I'll take that as well. And um, I'm going to give you a, a, a general answer on this because I, I, I haven't been directly involved in the, in the quality assurance process. But the items that get flagged, first of all, the, the data don't get changed. They just get flagged um, as outliers. So the data are preserved and are available to use as long as you, you know, kind of hit that outlier flag and are willing to, to accept the datum or not. Some of the tests that they run are uh, uh, kind of a spatial coherence type test. How does this value um, jive with the neighboring stations? Is it, is it completely different than many of the neighboring stations? Uh, if so, that might trigger uh, a flag. Um, is the value larger than the climatological extreme that has been observed for, for that part of the world as well? Um, so if it, uh, something that, I, I don't think it's exactly called a range test, but is basically um, for that part of the world, um, is this really bigger than, than the uh, kind of expected maximum uh, for that? And again, uh, those are the types of tests that are going on. Is this uh, outlier in the sense that the, the variability, the, the, you know, is this part of a pattern of, of a number repeating itself over time where a station may be 
spitting out um, information that, that is repetitive and an algorithm picks up on that and says, hey, you may want to look at this. So there's lots of little tests like that. I'd emphasize that the data are preserved, they're flagged as an outlier, and in a lot of times, and this is all, unfortunately but understandably the case with a lot of extreme observations, they do look really big. They are outliers even if they are genuine, and so a lot of these outlier tests will, will go ahead and flag those um, conservatively, uh, just in case. Thanks. Um, one last question um, for uh, both of you. Um, what are federal funding program opportunities of climate change research grants that you can recommend? And then also, can you be collaborators on these proposals where a climatologist expertise is needed? I'm going to let Doug answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> Not fair. Um, uh, so there, there are many, many sort of federal, but there are also many um, NSF. I guess that's federal too in a way. But uh, many, many versions or opportunities out there um, to, to look for research monies. Um, I, I'm not even going to try. But many of the partners that we listed up there. Um, uh, have those opportunities embedded in them from a federal side anyway. Um, I guess uh, there are, if, if you want to, if you're looking for federal grants, there is a particular website to go to um, for most federal announcements in terms of grants. I'm, I'm, I'm not remembering it off the top of my head. Um, I'm sure you could Google that too. But, um, um, as far as collaborating, um, it is possible that we can collaborate as long as it's not NOAA-based uh, funds or something related to us. Um, that Yes, so the answer to that is, uh, the caveat is, you know, as long as it's not, you know, something we're, we would be funding, I guess. It really depends. How about that? That's, a good, that's my answer. And I believe grants.gov is the clearinghouse that, that – Yeah, that's really difficult for me to remember for some reason. Hey, while we're talking, just really quickly, um, there are there are three websites that I forgot to put on, and they're very simple, and they have oodles of information on sort of these climate services and climate information type things. And one of them is climate.gov. In fact, you can get to a lot of NCDC information via climate.gov. Weather.gov, obviously, if you want weather information, you go there. And then finally, drought.gov, which has an uh, incredible amount of information as well. So, just wanted to mention those. Thanks, Doug. Uh, well, I think we're out, actually out of time. It's about 10 after, so I don't want to keep uh, both of you on too long. Uh, thank you so much for uh, presenting here today. We had so many people who really wanted to get more information about NOAA Climate Resources, and you were able to provide that for them. So we really appreciate both you, uh, Doug Cluck, and Dee Art for your willingness to talk to us today. Uh, really an excellent discussion, excellent questions. Uh, also, a thank you to Ohio State University National Sea Grant College Program and the Ohio Supercomputer for funding this webinar. I did want to remind everyone that our, our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature, so please uh, take a few minutes to fill that out. I also wanted to refer you to resources and an archive of all previous webinar presentations which are located on our changingclimate.osu.edu site. This webinar series is sponsored by the OSU Climate Change Outreach Team and will host the next webinar October 9th with uh, Daria Kluver of uh, Central Michigan University who will be talking about snowfall. The registration is up in the chat feature, so feel free to register now. Thank you again to Doug and Deke and all the participants on this webinar. We hope that this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thanks a lot, Deke and Doug. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you.